No, no introduction. Um, Nathan Hogue, one of the fourth year urology residents here at UBC. I'll be giving the urology grand round today on the contemporary diagnosis and management of priapism. And we're lucky enough to have Dr. McCann talk to us today as well from the Department of Radiology. We'll be talking about the um, radiologic um, use of embolization for high flow priapism as well as ultrasound in the diagnosis. What we'll be talking about today, uh, review the uh, clinical presentation and workup of priapism. Uh, Dr. McCann will talk about the uh, radiologic uh, investigations and interventions as they relate to priapism. And we'll review the uh, current and potential medical and surgical treatment options uh, for priapism. So priapism, uh, defined as a pathologic condition of penile erection lasting beyond or unrelated to uh, sexual stimulation and um, defined as persisting beyond four hours time. The um, incidence is calculated in person years, uh, largely dependent on the uh, local population and the prevalence of sickle cell disease, but averages about 1 to 1 1.5 per 100,000 person years. And it's one of our true urologic emergencies um, and divided into two pathologic and clinical subtypes, the low flow or ischemic priapism and the high flow or non-ischemic priapism, plus a third subtype or stuttering priapism, which is a form of recurrent uh, low flow uh, priapism that we won't have too much time uh, to speak about today, we'll focus on the low flow and high flow. So uh, priapism, originally named after Priapus, the Greek god of fertility, um, classically shown in the pictures with the disproportionately and large um, permanent erection. Um, and it was originally described by Frank Hinman Sr. in 1914. And then it was his uh, son, Frank Hinman Jr., who proposed the um, ischemic um, hypothesis behind the uh, nature of priapism. So looking at some of the um, reviews and the old treatment options for priapism, they also had a, a stepwise uh, approach to uh, trying to manage priapism, starting with uh, more uh, less or less invasive options, uh, potassium bromide, uh, mercury, rhubarb, which were which was, sounds like they were ineffective and probably quite toxic, and moving on to more surgical options like leeches applied to the penis, uh, bloodletting, and finally if those failed, uh, using the lancet to incise the, the penis. So we'll uh, proceed with uh, a case now, a typical night, 2.16 a.m. Of course, we're on call at St. Paul's Hospital. A pager goes off. Uh, it's the emergency department, and Dr. Finkler's on the line. Uh, he's got a patient who's had a three-day erection after experimenting with some drugs and uh, wants to know what to do. Uh, so we go see the, this guy, 43-year-old man. Uh, his story is that his boyfriend had injected him with some Trimix again, and this time it's been up for three days also admits to taking some Viagra, doesn't know how much, some cocaine and some crystal meth, and cites this as the reason for not seeking attention sooner. Um, his past medical history, he has HIV and had one previous episode of priapism under similar circumstances where someone had injected him with um, Trimix, um, but presented promptly and um, responded to aspiration, and now states he had normal erections prior to this episode. So on physical examination, he had fully rigid corporal bodies. The glands and spongiosum was turgid, but uh, not fully rigid. Uh, it was extremely painful. He was in a lot of discomfort, um, both on its own and to palpation. Uh, no evidence of any external genitourinary trauma. And we had penile blood gases drawn, which showed an acidosis pH 6.8 and um, hypoxic, which was uh, suspicious for uh, ischemic priapism. So on history, uh, which elements are important to uh, tease out? Um, well, it's important to determine whether the priapism is either high flow or low flow, so your uh, line of questioning should be uh, able to elicit this. Um, the duration of the erection is important to uh, find out, as this will sort of guide your uh, outcomes and expected course. We know that the longer the priapism lasts, uh, the less chance of having future spontaneous erections. Um, whether there's any pain, again, the low flow will classically uh, associated with pain. Any previous history of priapism and the treatment options received for that. The use of drugs. Um, any history of pelvic or perineal trauma. And this is um, often precedes the high flow priapism. And whether there's any history of sickle cell disease or other um, blood disorder. And for the physical examination, it's important to examine the genitalia and the perineum, <coughs> looking for any signs of trauma, exam examining the abdomen, or and also for any signs of um, malignancy. Um, classically, the, the cavernosa are affected and quite rigid, while the spongiosum and glands tend to be more relatively spared. 
um, and for the ischemic prepism, the corpora tend to be fully rigid, uh, while the non-ischemic prepism t tends to be not quite be quite as rigid. And so the diagnostic workup um, from the AUA guidelines for prepism. Um, CBC uh, should be obtained to look for any uh, hematologic or infectious causes for uh, prepism, a reticulocyte site count which will be elevated in sickle cell disease, a urine tox screen if, um, there's, been, if there's a suspicion that he, they've used um, any drugs, uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis again to rule out sickle cell disease, uh, penile blood gases or um, ultrasound should be obtained at a minimum, um, and then Dr. McCann will talk more about the use of the uh, ultrasound and uh, penile arteriography. And so for a typical uh, low flow prepism, uh, down here you'll see it tends to be uh, hypoxemic and um, acidotic. Uh, the normal penis will have a normal uh, mixed venous uh, blood pattern and then the um, high flow prepism will show a normal arterial blood uh, gas pattern. So before we move on to talk about the uh, pathophysiology of um, low flow prepism. We'll just talk briefly about the um, erection uh, physiology as it pertains um, to help us understand the pathophysiology. So the erection physiology is controlled by the nitrous oxide CGMP signaling pathway. The uh, nitro oxide diffuses into the smooth muscle here, activates glomerular cyclase, which causes increased GMP, and then this um, takes down the uh, signaling pathway, which causes uh, smooth muscle relaxation and um, promotes erection, and then the PD-5 inhibitors act here um, to promote the persistence of the uh, erection. So the uh, pathophysiology of uh, low flow prepism results from uh, derangement in penile hemodynamics, and uh, there's an abnormality of the veno-occlusive mechanism where the blood can't be returned to the circulation, and you end up with venostasis in the penis and the accumulation of deoxygenated blood. This in turn uh, leads to impaired smooth muscle function, endothelial cell dysfunction, and PD5 dysregulation. The end result of this is upregulation of uh, profibrotic growth factors, uh, TGF beta, which leads to uh, smooth muscle necrosis, collagen deposition, uh, penile fibrosis, and eventually erectile dysfunction. And this erectile dysfunction can be quite um, devastating in these uh, young patients who sometimes otherwise have totally normal erectile function prior to this. And so what are the etiologies uh, of ischemic prepism? Well, he hematologic um, is a big one. Of course, sickle cell disease uh, is the most common reason for prepism in the pediatric population. Um, someone with um, sickle cell disease had a, has about a 30 to 40 percent chance over their lifetime of developing prepism at some point. Some of the other blood uh, disorders, leukemia, EPO, TPN, uh, which can cause uh, prepism. Iatrogenic or the intracavernosal injections, uh, which are now the most common reason uh, for preopism in the adult population. Other causes, uh, neoplastics, either by direct uh, invasion or metastases, bladder, prostate, and penile cancer. Uh, neurologic conditions and infectious uh, conditions can cause it as well. And of course, there's a long list of medications that can cause preopism. Uh, alpha blockers have been implicated, the anticoagulants, uh, heparin and warfarin. Um, trazodone, classically one of the um, culprits, as well as uh, recreational drugs, alcohol, cocaine, uh, marijuana, and PD-5 inhibitors. So the goals for management of prepism, um, ultimately to achieve detumescence and attempt to preserve uh, erectile function by preventing the fibrosis. We go through a stepwise treatment algorithm of increasing invasiveness, and of course, important to treat any underlying concurrent uh, disease, such as sickle cell with oxygen, fluids, blood transfusions as needed. Um, and we should mention that some of the evidence that we talk about today is it's largely unclear, and there's a heavy reliance on expert opinion and consensus statements, um, mainly just because of a poor um, follow-up of patients and a very heterogeneous patient population, and um, <coughs> probably a lot of patients that uh, don't present at all. Um, so the evidence for the medical management of uh, preopism, there's really only uh, min minimal evidence. Uh, pseudoephedrine uh, was uh, tested in a, a double-blind study and found to be uh, no better than placebo. Uh, there was three studies that looked at terbutaline uh, orally in the treatment of preopism. Uh, two of them did show a slightly better uh, effect than um, 
placebo in one study showed no effect, but the success rate was still uh, fairly low at 36 to 42 percent compared to 12 to 15 for placebo. So, um, possible use for this, but really, if if at all, more of as an adjunct and not as a primary treatment. There's also one small study that looked at methylene blue that showed a fairly good resolution of pre with 19 out 22, um, but it didn't go any further than that. Um, so as far as medical management, there's probably only very minimal evidence and shouldn't really be used as a um, standard treatment option. And next, the next, uh, the main um, treatment of prepism is the aspiration and irrigation. Uh, so the first step would be just the uh, aspirating the uh, corpora and irrigating with normal saline. Um, about 24 to 36 percent of the patients will resolve uh, with aspiration alone. Um, 43 to 81 uh, percent resolution rate with aspiration plus the injection of um, sympathomimetic um, and this is from several case series and of course um, these should be attempted before any kind of shunting procedures are uh, performed. Now phenylephrine is the uh, recommended sympathomimetic um, in the literature. It's slightly less effective than epinephrine but has a lot less ionotropic and chronotropic uh, effects so that is the um, our gold standard, and of course, um, the penile block should be placed uh, before any, any attempting any of these um, aspiration um, and injections in the emergency department. So, just going over um, the um, technical aspects of the phenylephrine injection and aspiration, again, for some of the R1s and 2s who haven't done it yet, um, one ampule of the phenylephrine can be put into a uh, 100 uh, cc normal saline mini bag which gives you a concentration of 100 micrograms per milliliter. And one to two milliliters can, of this can be injected into the uh, corpora every three to five minutes. It should be done in a monitored setting um, in the emergency department um, and should carry on for about one hour's time uh, before declaring the treatment of failure. It should be noted that any prepism lasting longer than 42 to, uh, 48 to 72 hours has a fairly, unlike, a fairly low chance of working uh, with just the um, injection and aspiration. Uh, between each injection it's recommended that there is um, an aspiration by pinching the base of the penis trying to suck out the, um, the old blood and um, technically only one side of the um, injection is necessary. There should be some, some communication between the uh, corpora. And you can see that it's actually quite alarming sometimes how much <clears throat> blood can be pulled out of the uh, penis and looking from left to right through successive uh, irrigations the blood does take on a different kind of appearance, starting at a very dark, deoxygenated looking blood and proceeding to a more lighter, um, more oxygenated looking blood on the right. And, and this picture shows the uh, placement of the um, needle in the side of the penis at the base uh, where the aspiration and irrigation uh, takes place. So next we'll talk a little bit about the uh, surgical shunts. And these are divided anatomically, starting with the distal shunts, the open distal, uh, proximal shunts, the uh, saphenous vein shunt, and the dorsal vein shunt. And the goal of any of these shunting procedures is to um, attempt to re reoxygenate the cavernous smooth muscle and create an fistula between the corpora cavernosa and either the spongiosum or the glands or veins. So the first one we'll talk about is the winter shunt. And again, some of these distal shunts can be performed in the emergency department, but it takes a bit of uh, judgment on that and which patients will tolerate that. Some, some may not. Um, the winter shunt is done either with a true cut uh, biopsy gun or an angiocat needle. It's transglandular, inserted through the um, glands into the corpora and attempts to uh, create a fistula, um, allowing blood to flow between the cavernosa and the uh, spongiosum in the glands. It can be done either unilaterally or bilaterally and the uh, resolution rate is about 66% uh, for this one. Um, one of the um, the next um, distal shunt is the Eberhard shunt. Um, again, this is a transglandular approach. Uh, uses an 11 blade, which is passed uh, several times through the glands into the corpora uh, cavernosum, and then the uh, blood is milked out of the penis. Um, it can be done either unilaterally or bilaterally, and its published uh, resolution rate is about 73%. Um, this area here shows the um, the stab of the uh, 11 blade for the Ebaha shunt, and this one over here on the other side uh, is the uh, T shunt, which we'll talk about in just a second here. So, the T shunt um, 
is a little bit of a newer uh, described technique um, in which a uh, vertical incision in the uh, glands is made uh, four millimeters lateral to the urethral meatus through the glands into the corpora cavernosum. The uh, 10 blade is turned uh, 90 degrees away from the uh, urethra, and that's to avoid any injury to the urethra that could occur. And then the blood is milked out. Uh, it's recommended that you wait 10 or 15 minutes to watch to see if the erection returns. And if it does, then a, a second or bilateral uh, T shunt can be performed. And again, some of the newer techniques are talking about doing uh, corporal tunneling. Uh, using uh, dilators um, after the T shunt is performed uh, to dilate up the uh, corpora and try to um, enhance the uh, fistula formation between the corpora cavernosa and the spongiosum. Um, so, the um, results for the uh, T shunt, and this is a study that Dr. Liu did a few years back, um, recommended um, corporal dilatation more if um, the erection lasted more than 36 hours. Um, again, the skin you can see here is closely disabsorbable suture, and they did a study on 13 men, seven of which had the uh, dilatation, um, all of which underwent resolution, and the post-op shim score was 18.9, which they felt was reasonable erectile function um, post-procedure. Next shunt we'll talk about is the Algorab shunt, which is an open distal shunt. And this um, shunt, the uh, glands is uh, opened and a piece of the uh, corpora cavernosum is excised. Um, once this is done, the, um, again, the, the penis is milked and uh, some of the blood is tempted to be expressed um, and then closed and then in hopes that the uh, fish will be created to allow blood flow between the cavernosum and the spongiosum. Again, it can be done either unilaterally or bilaterally as well. Its um, resolution rate is about 74%. And in addition to the Algorab shunt, as far as open uh, shunts go, um, there's again some new studies looking at um, dilatation of the corpora with the corporal uh, snake maneuver, in which a Hegar, dilat Hegar dilator is inserted several centimeters through the opening that was created with the Algorab shunt, named after the plumber's snake uh, technique, which is um, attempting to clear a blockage. Um, and they did say in, the, in their um, study that the erectile dysfunction was quite likely to occur with this uh, technique because the uh, dilator is fairly good caliber, um, though resolution did happen in three out of three patients. Um, one out of three um, had some erectile function recovery good enough for intercourse, and one out of three had partial uh, erectile function recovery. Um, so they do mention that at this point, that they tr when they tried these um, dilators, the natural history of the uh, disease is likely that heading towards erectile dysfunction anyways. And then one slightly um, <clears throat> larger study of 10 patients, uh, long-term follow-up with seven months, um, was successful in eight out of 10. Uh, two of the patients underwent immediate insertion of penile prosthesis for failure to resolve, and partial erectile function was recovered in two of the eight patients who had the corporal snake uh, maneuver and two of ten had fairly serious complications. Uh, one had a urethrocutaneous fistula and one had um, skin uh, necrosis of the penis. So moving back to case number one, um, did have the aspiration and phenylephrine injection in the emergency department um, for one hour, was unsuccessful. Uh, we did a winter shunt with an 18 gauge needle through the glands uh, bilaterally in the emergency department. He didn't tolerate this terribly well um, and was unsuccessful. The uh, patient was taken to the operating room. He had bilateral epilogue and T shunts, uh, both unsuccessful um, in the operating room. The erection returned quite promptly and we decided to proceed with the proximal shunt. So we'll talk about some of the proximal shunts now. Uh, the coaxial shunt is um, shown here in, in the diagram. Um, attempts to create a, a corporal cavernosum and spongiosum uh, communication. Uh, it's done by uh, cutting an ellipse of the um, uh, corporal cavernosum and spongiosum and uh, suturing these together. Now the uh, proximal shunts do have a fairly high rate of erectile dysfunction, but again this may be uh, partially due to patient selection. The patients who are undergoing the proximal shunts have failed all the uh, distal shunts and again their natural history is likely to proceed with um, erectile dysfunction anyway. Um, and if the clacal shunt can be performed bilaterally, and in this case it's termed a satchel shunt, uh, 
and uh, if they are performed bilaterally, they should, should be spaced um, more than one centimeter apart uh, to prevent any compromise to the spongiosum and urethra itself. And then next we'll talk about the, uh, the gray hack shunt. Um, so this is where a uh, wedge of tunica is actually excised, and the saphenous vein is um, anastomosed to the um, corpora cavernosa. Um, there's no good trials on um, the vein chunting uh, to compare the different um, uh, vein shunts. There's a fairly high rate of uh, thrombosis for these um, shunts themselves and has several case reports of pulmonary embolism due to the thrombogenic uh, nature. Um, looking at a few of the studies that were, were done, there's between a 10 and 69 percent rate of erectile function recovery after the vascular shunts, uh, so presumably pretty low um, rates. And um, there's, that hasn't been too much written about these lately, um, probably because of the unacceptably uh, high complication rate. There was one study um, looking at a dorsal vein shunt with a um, saphenous vein graft, um, and uh, nine of the patients had, did have some uh, return of erectile recovery, and six out of nine enough for sexual activity. And the uh, dorsal, classic dorsal vein shunt is done by ligating the, uh, the dorsal vein of the penis and uh, anastomosin it to the uh, cavernosum. So some of the new uh, research has been focusing on the immediate insertion of inflatable penile prosthesis. Um, one of the downsides of the immediate insertion of uh, penile prosthesis is that it's irreversible, um, but does avoid the difficulty of inserting the prosthesis into a shortened and fibrotic penis, uh, which sounds like it can be uh, quite a problem um, long term after uh, priapism. Um, there is a fairly high risk of, uh, of erosion of the um, implant, um, especially if the, there was treatment with the corporal dilatation as part of the treatment for the um, priapism itself, either with the heat guard dilator or the uh, T-shunt with corporal dilatation. Um, the first, uh, there was one small study of five patients who had all failed shunting uh, between three and 20 days, uh, all went uh, insertion of um, inflatable penile prosthesis and were all uh, quoted as satisfied and engaging in centric sexual intercourse with no complications long term. Uh, timing of the insertion can be a bit of a problem as we should wait at least 48 hours um, to watch for any um, potential recovery of a native erectile function, erectile function that might um, return and it has been done up to three weeks um, um, post um, priapism without um, complications from the fibrosis. And there's a second study of a larger um, patient group, 50 patients, uh, 43 of these underwent a malleable um, prosthesis, and uh, seven had uh, immediate insertion of uh, inflatable penile prosthesis. They chose the seven patients who um, had less edema of the penis and were better surgical candidates for the procedure. The mean um, duration of the previous was 209 hours. 96% um, of these patients reported being fully satisfied um, postoperatively. There was quite a high revision rate of 24%. You can see down here, uh, several of them elected to change to a three-piece device, uh, three incidences of infection and three of erosion. Um, so 24% is, is quite high for um, uh, complication rate. So back to our case, uh, the patient uh, eventually um, in the OR uh, achieved detumescence with the quackle shunt. Uh, he has partial um, recovery of erectile dysfunction and is dependent on ICI for um, erections now and was discharged home successfully after 24 hours. So the outcomes for ischemic priapism, well, as we mentioned, the longer the episode, the less likely for the preservation of erectile uh, function. Um, in greater than 24 hours, it's been published that there's a greater than 90% rate of erectile dysfunction. In less than 24 hours, um, it was published a 92% um, erectile function recovery rate. And um, more recently, in 2008, 39 patients treated for priapism. Um, those less than 12 hours, 100% of them uh, had spontaneous return of erections. And of course, this is decreasing with the longer duration of the priapism itself. And patients should probably be counseled on this accordingly. Uh, if it has been a longer duration, um, their expectations uh, shouldn't be unrealistic, and that uh, erectile dysfunction is that natural history after these uh, long durations. And so, where is the um, future uh, research headed? Uh, there was some uh, talk about using um, PD5 inhibitors. Uh, because there's evidence that the priapism involved the dysregulation of the PD5 expression. These are in patients who are prone to recurrence, uh, sickle cell patients, um, and that alterations in the nitric oxide CGMP cascade um, led to a relaxed uh, penile vascular bed, down regulation of PD5 activity, 
predisposing them to priapism. And there was some thought that um, the long-term use of PD-5 inhibitors may restore this enzymatic, enzymatic activity and reset the penis to um, homeostatic levels. Uh, there was some promise in the animal models, but it hasn't progressed to any human studies yet. I think there's a couple of um, anecdotal reports, uh, but still um, in its infancy. And also, uh, there's been some interest in looking at um, uh, TGF-beta as a, a prophyrobotic uh, cytokine responsible for the fibrosis of priapism. Uh, there was a postulation that injecting TGF-beta neutralizing antibodies uh, into the um, corpora cavernosa in the early phase may uh, decrease some of the uh, fibrosis, and this was um, shown to be quite promising in the animal model. Again, hasn't um, translated into any human studies yet. So that's the uh, ischemic priapism, and we'll, if there's any questions about that, yeah. Just a couple of comments. Uh, yeah. These are just practical uh, points for me to, for the residents. Uh, if it goes down to our strengthening procedure, don't do it in the emergency department. These are high risk patients. The last thing you need is that good. And you know, sticking a, a tube pack or a, a scalpel into the distal corpus is actually quite hard. The distal corpus is very thick and hard. So take them to the OR, it's always safe. Uh, my go to the to the Vistal is still a key trend, I like it. Uh, I always like to put my phrase suction down. Uh, now, you always got to kind of rely not to break down the whole uh, uh, corporal body because you want to try and preserve some of that corporal body. Mm -hmm. So, you know, don't put too many phrases too soon. <coughs> and then, approximately the same thing. I always take a piece of the corporal body that I do with cat as well. It's the size of our lips. Yeah. But if you can, and, uh, again, you see a lot of them down but they're high risk patients, so you gotta protect yourself first. So do only what you can in there. Can you do the proxy when you stick this up here? Uh, yeah. But again, I don't, don't, uh, I don't uh, try to do that with uh, that sound of anger. Try and maintain it as much as you can. And I find that the, the, obviously the bigger the, 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 the length of the shunt, you want to know how, how long the shunt and you know, plastic is to be up to two centimeters mm -hmm. long. But the longer you make it, you know, the chance of them beginning any function gets to be more. So. Yeah. Well, I don't know. No cross the reversibility of those proximal shunt system particles that were successfully seen in the Well, they're, they're, mo they're mostly sort of small case series, two or three patients. Um, as far as reversibility, you mean like surgically reversing them? No, I didn't read anything about reverse. I think as far as I know, it's just permanent. Did you read anything about the use of I didn't read anything about high flow priapism use and uh, PD5 inhibitors. The only thing that I read about was um, uh, antiandrogens or luprolide they're using for high flow priapism in, in one small study. We'll talk about it in a second, but um, nothing about PD5. Have you heard about <coughs> PD5 inhibitors for high flow? No. no. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it hasn't been tried in high flow yet. Yeah. Okay, we'll move on now to. Um, Another case, a little bit shorter. Um, this is a 32-year-old man, not the same patient, um, who had six previous visits to the emergency department for low flow priapism. He had blood gases taken on the first two, which were confirmed documented to be hypoxemic and ischemic priapism. Um, he'd always responded to the irrigation with phenylephrine. He presented always promptly and denies any drug use, no medications. He had a negative hematologic workup, no sickle cell disease, no history of any trauma, um, and was diagnosed with recurrent idiopathic ischemic priapism. This time presented with a five-hour history of painless erection. Um, the uh, corporal bodies were tumescent but not fully erect, and this time it was suspected that he had high-flow priapism. Um, the thought was given that we, at some point uh, during some of these visits and irrigations and aspirations, the low-flow priapism uh, was probably converted to a high-flow priapism by um, creating a fistula with the um, irrigation and aspiration of, um, of blood. So high flow priapism, uh, defined as a persistent erection, unrelated to cavern uh, unregulated cavernosal uh, arterial inflow. Um, the uh, corpora tend to be tumescent, but not as fully rigid as in the low flow. Not usually painful. Quite a rare uh, diagnosis, and the natural history is for resolution versus erectile dysfunction compared to um, low flow priapism. The uh, etiology of high flow priapism, classically uh, secondary to a uh, straddle injury, but also has been found secondary to coital trauma blunt trauma to the penis or perineum, uh, pelvic fractures, needle lacerations, uh, vascular erosions, and some uh, post-procedures have been reported after DVIU and the Nesbitt procedure. Pathophysiology of uh, high flow, 
is where the trauma or injury tends to lead to a disruption of the cavernous arterial anatomy and creates a fistula or shunt leading to increase the arterial inflow into the cavernosa. In this case, the venoocclusive mechanism is intact and therefore the cavernosus environment doesn't become ischemic. And this is, once it's uh, correctly diagnosed, this um, does not require emergent intervention. About 60% will resolve with uh, conservative treatment at some point, um, though the time, time frame is not given for that, and uh, there's no studies comparing uh, conservative treatment versus angiography, probably it's because it's quite a rare uh, disease itself. So our patient had an ultrasound, um, dem demonstrated increased uh, venous flow to the distal and proximal penis, and increased arterial flow in the left corporal body. He then went on to have angiography of the left uh, pudendal artery, um, demonstrated a fistula between the pudendal artery and the cavernosa. He had um, angioembolization of the left uh, penal artery with autologous blood and gel foam and had complete resolution of his uh, high flow prepism. Two years of, after two years follow-up, um, had, had normal erectile function and no further episodes. So treatment of high flow prepism. The options, expectant management is one option with, um, with or without ice and compresses. There was a study by Dr. Liu that I mentioned briefly earlier uh, on androgen blockade. Uh, seven patients with high flow prepism treated with two to six months of uh, luprolide, um, and all of these results came off the um, luprolide and erectile function returned. There's angiography and embolization, um, which Dr. McCann will talk a bit more uh, about later today, and the preservation of erectile function about uh, 75 to 86 percent. And then the last um, option is uh, surgical ligation of the um, fistula itself. So, thanks Dr. Mahang for coming today and talking about the um, radiologic aspects and the diagnosis and treatment of prepism. I think he's got some uh, slides for us here. In that second case was presented, was that the location of that fistula, is that potentially iatrogenic or was it removed from the fistula? Well, we, we, we assumed that it was, um, was, it was from the, the needle. The needle pokes. I'm not sure on the uh, how it relates to the, the needle pokes exactly in the anatomy, but we assume that that fish was secondary to um, the previous uh, injections. Yeah. Good morning. Oh, sorry. Uh, is this keynote? No, it's. Uh, So our, uh, you know, we have a very limited view on uh, uh, pre um, uh Typical, um, these guys give these spectacular histories that uh, make the female staff just go, hmm, serves you right, and the, uh, and the male guy, you know, all the male staff sit there and cringe. Uh, um, I'll show you a few. Um, and, and basically, you know, uh, what we're talking about, all of them have the same kind of picture. And that first angiogram was a very nice description of it, where you see um, unregulated flow in the lacunar space, to say, of the central cavernosal artery. And you just have a rent of this artery, usually against the symphysis. And, you, uh, and that's basically what we're seeing. Uh, the sine qua non, as everyone knows, is it's painless. And you get distension in the cavernosal bodies. Uh, but the spongiosa tends to be flaccid. <clears throat> Um, here's a 32-year-old carpenter who was standing up on a counter, and the cupboard door below him was uh, open, and he slipped off the car off the off with uh, fell onto the top of the cupboard door. Um, what we what we tend to use are temporary agents. Gel foam is gel and sponge, um, and the idea being that we just decrease the uh, the arterial inflow uh, long enough to allow the artery to heal and hopefully uh, uh, reinstate the uh, normal anatomy. So. Uh, here you see the internal pudendal artery, and here you see the, uh, the artery coming down, and, and here you see just basically this rent with filling of this little lacunar space uh, in the uh, cavernosal body. And this is a perfect result where after embolization we maintain all the normal uh, vascularity, but we've uh, uh, turned off the shunt. That isn't always uh, achievable. Um, this, by the way, is the same uh, kind of picture that uh, some of you may have read about uh, embolization for uh, uh, BPH, and this is the same kind of uh, uh, embolization that we would do for that. Here's a guy who uh, worked in a pipe factory and was walking along the pipes and slipped and fell, again a straddle injury with one leg on either side. Uh, he had a, a partial erection for three and a half weeks before he uh, finally came in. 
Um, the, um, again, uh, just basically a similar kind of picture where you see this sort of blush that you really shouldn't see. With a steep obliquity, you can see a single feeding artery. Um, but um, uh, in fact, um, the trick is, is that you actually find that there's two arteries in this guy. And so if you don't embolize both of them, uh, you're not going to successfully treat him. Um, after uh, a three-month follow-up, uh, after embolization, this man, again with a temporary agent, um, he had uh, um, uh, far, uh, required pharmacologic assistance for his erections. Um, uh, so this was embolized with a temporary agent, and this had a coil plunked into it as well. Um, here's a guy. Uh, he had uh, four different university degrees, and um, his wife dragged him in because he'd been walking around in sweatpants for, for ages, and she, uh, because he'd been walking around with an erection. Um, and, and one of the points I want to make on him is that um, when you send your patients uh, for ultrasound, unless... Uh, find out that if somebody actually imaged underneath the scrotum because that's always where the abnormality is. Uh, the tendency is just to examine the shaft of the penis and you'll often miss it. So for, here's the longitudinal view of the cavernosal artery. So this is a longitudinal view of the cavernosal body and, and it just looks like a normal uh, waveform and you, you would miss it. Sometimes you'll see increased flow on one side compared to the other but sometimes it just looks totally normal. So what you have to do is look transversely underneath the scrotum. So here's the view in this guy, this particular university professor. So here's the normal side. So there you see the cavernosal body in transverse section on the left and you can see basically that looks normal. On the right you can see this sort of dilated space uh, red means that the blood's going away from the transducer, in this particular case, blue towards. And so you're seeing blood going both towards and away from the transducer, indicating turbulent uh, flow within that space. Uh, in this uh, particular case, uh, he had embolization uh, with uh, gelatin sponge. And uh, uh, you can see again, when we uh, uh, get down into the artery, you can see this, this uh, little dilated space here, and we embolized. Um, uh, completely, but he had uh, minimal recovery of erectile function at three months, even with pharmacologic assistance. Um, he did look um, optimal at the end of it, and you can see on ultrasound that we were able to take away. You don't no longer have that space. You just see this is the sort of clot in the lacuna. That's the outline of the cavernosal body, the right cavernosal body right there. Here's a guy who's a ski instructor who slipped and fell and uh, got one leg on either side of the poles at the base of the pole holding up a ski lift. He slid down and managed to hit it with his bum pointed towards it. Um, and, um, and, and this slide is really more for uh, my radiologic colleagues uh, because the point is not to embolize until you see the, the dilated space. So here you see we've done a pigtail injection. In this case, this is an older case that I did at, uh, at UBC many years ago. I think this might have been your case, actually, John, if I'm not mistaken. Either yours or Yankees. And uh, anyway, um, you can see this blush that's here just with a, a distal aortic injection. And then we get more selective, and you can see this irregular space. But if you embolize until this goes away, but this doesn't go away, you're not done. And so sometimes we'll do, uh, we'll just keep going. In fact, take out the entire anterior division, the internal iliac artery on each side, if needs be, uh, until we get uh, this result. Because if you don't get detumescence on the table, your embolization hasn't worked. Um, just uh, before we um, uh, merged with uh, uh, VGH, uh, we had done uh, 14 patients. One of our fellows did a a little follow-up um, between ages 21 to 53 years. We saw them between two days and three months after the injury. We used autologous blood clot in four. That was the older way of doing it. Uh, gelatin sponge in five. Uh, microcoils and gel foam in five. Um, Detumescence was only recorded in, in, um, in 10 of the 14 patients. And in nine of the 10 uh, uh, could uh, uh, detumescence be achieved on the table. Um, of the 14 uh, patients, so we get follow-up on eight. Uh, four had spontaneous uh, erections. This was at least uh, three months follow-up. Uh, three were requiring pharmacologic assistance, and one that university professor basically was having no erectile function. So out of eight patients, uh, seven were achieving some type of um, erectile function. Um, the most common agents uh, uh, used uh, are autologous blood clots and gel foam, mostly gel foam now for ease of use, although it does cause a significant um, 
inflammatory response in the artery, um, glue uh, microcoils, and um, priapism can occur within in one month in 30 to 40 percent, and it's entirely reasonable to just do a reembolization. It's uh, uh, very easy to do and usually involves a second branch that wasn't embolized the first time uh, but as I say sometimes you just you can take out the entire anterior division with relatively uh, relative impunity. Um, in the literature uh, a couple of publications, this is an older publication in the Journal of Urology, seven patients uh, who were seen between four and 126 days uh, after, uh, treat, after um, uh, injury seven out of seven were successfully embolized. In this publication, six out of seven regained uh, uh, full erection at follow-up of two weeks to five months. Um, in um, a, 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 I think a more optimistic article uh, published in 2007, uh, nine embolizations in six patients, uh, five were traumatic, one was an idiopathic high flow. Uh, uh, they used gel foam in nine of the arteries and gel foam and, micro, and microcoils or microcoils alone. Um, and in that five-year follow-up, no complications recorded, and six out of six uh, patients in whom detumescence was achieved at the time of embolization all had uh, normal erectile function. So in terms of the conclusion, uh, it's important to embolize until uh, detumescence. So if they send the patient back to you and uh, um, um, if things are still standing at attention, um, uh, you should call the radiologist and find out if there's a reason for it. Uh, but uh, um, it, it means that uh, more likely a more extensive embolization is required. You definitely want to use temporary agents. Ideally, you don't want to use coils at all. Uh, you want to use gelatin sponge and uh, autologous blood clot. Um, and return of erectile function is uh, possible. Um, there's, it's very um, difficult to ascertain from the literature whether, the, in fact, it is uh, related to, as opposed to low flow priapism, whether the timing from the time of uh, injury to treatment uh, is as important to a risk factor or not. And that's all I got to say about that.